Well, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. First time in Ghent, not first time in, in Belgium. And a beautiful city. Uh, I have really uh, two goals today in this hour we have together. The first is to make you depressed. And uh, I think you'll like that because in Europe we, we do depression quite well. You only have to mention the weather and people get depressed. Um, and why depressed? Well, you, you know, we heard about Bob Dylan, the times are changing. He has another song called The Hard Rain's Gonna Fall. And, uh, you know, we're entering a period of hard rain. Uh, but the second goal is, is to make you feel happy. And uh, that, that's quite ambitious for a European audience. Uh, so if not happy, at least hopeful because I do believe that uh, there are many signs that we're making progress in the right direction. So, I always like to kick off just with the problem. If we can... This is the dilemma that we face as a global society, and I'll explain it to you very briefly. On the vertical axis here, we have the ecological footprint of the countries of the world. And in 1961, all the countries below this red line were countries living within the capacity of one planet. By 2006, the capacity of the planet had halved because we're using more resources and, of course, the population is growing rapidly. And all the countries that are below that red line are mainly in Africa and Asia. The countries above that line, of course, in Europe, if we all lived the same lifestyle around the world, we would need three planets. If we all lived like Americans, we would need five planets. And if we lived like Saudi Arabians, we would need six planets. And unfortunately, planets are hard to come by and very expensive to build. So we have a problem there. On the horizontal axis here, we have the Human Development Index of the United Nations. As you know, this comprises of health, wealth, and education. And all the countries to the right of this vertical red line are countries of high human development. And it's very clear where we are aiming to get our countries. It's in this box where not a single country is. So there is no country in the world that is achieving high human development within the capacity of the planet. We've figured out how to take countries out of poverty to a high quality of life, a good standard of living, but we don't know how to do it yet without sacrificing the environmental resources on which we depend. That is the challenge for our generation, to figure out this dilemma. How do we move countries who are developing still across to high human development without moving them up in their environmental impact. Maybe even more difficult, how do we move people like ourselves down in our environmental impact without us believing that we're giving up our quality of life? That is the challenge that we face as a generation. And this is the sense in which I will argue we are completely failing in our CSR agenda. We're not changing this picture one little bit. And unless we do that, we will always be just um, uh, shifting uh, chairs on the Titanic. I was going to say pissing in the wind, but I don't think, <laughs> I don't think I'm allowed to say that. Uh, it's uh, not after nine in, in the evening. So what's been the business response? Well. Uh, CSR. Actually, this is not a new response. We could go back 4,000 years, if you like, to the Indian Upanishads. You can find uh, some commentary on the ethics of business going all that time back. More recently, we think this is new. Well, go back to the 1870s. People like Rockefeller, uh, some of the grandfathers of philanthropy. We'll come back to him. But in the more modern sense, of course, we conceive of CSR as something like a triple bottom line. And I notice here behind me, people, planet, profit. I always think that that's missing a couple of things. 
The first is that it's definitely not just about profit anymore. So there is an economic component which I call value creation, which is about economic development, and economic development is much broader than just profits. And what tends to be missing, you can spot the societal and the environmental here, but there is a governance and ethics component which we must never forget about. This is the thread that must go through this triple bottom line if we're to uh, genuinely get a sustainable and responsible uh, business strategy. So this is the basic approach we've taken, uh, in, especially in the last 20 years or so. And the question is, is it really working? When I travel around uh, in the last 20 years, now to nearly 70 countries, trying to understand how business is dealing with agenda, this agenda, what I find is that they tend to fall into five stages of maturity. There are some that are still in an age of greed, quite frankly, and they have a defensive approach to CSR. It's all about compliance and risk management. And we sometimes forget that these companies are doing CSR. If we look at Enron, if we look at Lehman Brothers, ultimately they collapsed from their own cancer of greed, but Lehman Brothers even won a CSR award after it went bankrupt. Yeah? Strange as that may seem. So these are just companies that focus almost exclusively on the economics, on the shareholder return, and so employees know very clearly what their priorities are, and even though they do a little bit of CSR, maybe to keep the regulators happy and their employees happy, uh, it doesn't change the culture of the company, which is all about the financial returns. And then we know companies, many around the world, who are still stuck in an age of charity or philanthropy as an approach to CSR. And unfortunately, this is a little bit like the cartoon uh, where the CSR manager is sitting in front of his CEO and the CEO says, yes, yes, giving back to the community is a fine idea. Just make sure you take a lot more out first. And uh, we do tend to, to see this if we go back to Rockefeller, who we think of as the great grandfather of philanthropy because he gave away 95% of his wealth. He was the richest man in the world at the time. We forget that he was a very dodgy character. He was very unethical in his business dealings. He, uh, he ran the company Standard Oil. They controlled 70% of the US oil uh, in his time. And he got involved in price fixing, collusion. He was extremely aggressive in the market. At one point, he drove 23 of his 26 competitors out of business within four months in something called the Cleveland Massacre. So we forget about all of that because, hey, he was generous at the end. And we really need to question that model of charity that says it doesn't matter how you make your money, just be generous with it at the end. That is not good enough anymore. And then we get many companies who are stuck in an age of marketing with a promotional approach to CSR. In fact, if you ask CEOs why they do CSR, as they do occasionally at the World Economic Forum, most of them say they do it for reputation and brand. So the leaders of our biggest companies are still stuck in this stage where they think it really is just a public relations opportunity. And of course, we have to move beyond that as well. At its worst, we get a com company like BP changing its logo to Beyond Petroleum, which is a joke, right? Uh, um, <laughs> as Greenpeace liked to point out, in the year that they changed their logo, they spent more on the logo than on renewable energy. They've only spent 4% on renewable energy, and that's been going down year on year. So we really need to be careful about what claims companies are making compared to what they're delivering on the ground. And some research seems to suggest that our expectations of companies are going up in terms of what they should be delivering to society, and our perception of what they're actually delivering is going down. In other words, the gap is widening, the delivery gap. Then we get a lot of our com companies that are big branded companies and we think of them as leaders and they're actually in an age of 
management. They're taking a strategic approach to CSR. So we take an example here of Coca-Cola. They got into trouble in the district of Kerala in India because they were accused of stealing the water. It doesn't matter if that was true, that was the perception of the community. And so Coke belatedly realized that water is their strategic CSI issue. And they aligned that issue going forward with their activities so that they invested huge amounts in improving their own water efficiency and helping the communities that they work with to improve their water utilization. Notice they didn't change their strategy. All they did was align the CSI issue with their core business. And there are many companies doing that today. This is the age of codes and standards, of which by last count there are around about 450 CSR codes and standards. And we take this management systems approach as a way to tackle this agenda. Certainly better than promotional and charitable, but I argue all of these four approaches are the old way of doing things. These are the very approaches that have failed to change that first chart. And we actually have more CSR than ever before. Compared to when I started out 20 years ago, you know, it's like chalk and cheese. Companies are doing more than ever before, but are they achieving more than ever before when you compare it to the size and the scale of the issues? So I'm calling for something which I call transformative CSR or CSR 2.0. I don't really mind what label we give these things. Let's understand then why these other approaches are failing. The first is that they tend to promote an incremental approach. When you get on to management systems, this is the typical quality management system cycle. Plan, do, check, act. Anyone who knows ISO 9000 will be very familiar with this. And we've built 14,000 on this, and now even ISO 26000 on a similar principle. And actually, we do get continuous improvement from this, but what's the problem? Who's setting the objectives and targets that you put into a management system? The management. So you can be as unambitious as you like. In theory, you could be the most polluting company in the world, set a target of reducing your pollution by 1% over the next 100 years, and you could get these codes and standards. So we have a problem here of a, a disconnect between the size and scale of the issues, which, by the way, many of which are getting worse very rapidly. If we look at climate change, if we look at biodiversity loss, if we look at the gap between rich and poor, these are getting worse, not better. And this pro approach, although it creates gradual incremental improvements, just isn't up to the task. The second problem and I like to pick on the tobacco industry here because they're an easy target, is it tends to be peripheral, our approach to CSR. It sits on the side. I love their old adverts. Uh, you probably can't read the print, but it says, blow in her face and she'll follow you anyway. So <laughs> I've been meaning to try this, see if it still works. We don't even need to pick on the tobacco industry. In most companies, CSR is sitting on the side. It's either in a public relations or corporate affairs department or in an HR department. If you're lucky, it's in its own department, but even that tells you that it's not truly integrated. What we would really want to see is that marketing has its own understanding of CSR, finance, HR, operations. It gets completely embedded and integrated, and we're not there yet. It's also peripheral in another way, it sits on the side in the sense that it only tends to apply to big branded companies. And I know that there are representatives in this room of smaller companies, which is a really great sign, because for the most part when we talk about CSR, we're talking about the same usual suspects. But what about the hundreds of millions of SMEs in the world? If this doesn't apply to, him, to them, then we're wasting our time. The third problem with these approaches, which I call CSR 1.0, is that they tend to be uneconomic. 
Now, I realize that's like swearing in a forum like this because we like to say that there is a business case for CSR, and of course we can construct a business case. But if you stand back and look at the market, the market does not consistently reward the companies that are the most sustainable and responsible. It's unfortunate, but it's true. Here I take as an extreme just one example. This is the Vice Fund in the United States. It only invests in the so-called sin industries, like tobacco and gambling and military and, uh, uh, and alcohol. And in fact, it completely outperforms the market. So the message is clear, if you want to make money, invest in the least responsible and the least sustainable companies. And really, we have to change the market signals if we're going to make any headway in this agenda. The pricing needs to take into account the impacts that we're having on the environment and society. So why do I talk about 1.0 and 2.0? Of course, this is a metaphor. We're talking about the difference um, between the Web 1 and the Web 2. And what is the difference? Well, when the Internet was in its first incarnation, it was still at a small scale, only 45 million users by 1996, uh, and it went to scale, so a billion users by 2006. That's the first thing that has to change. The second is that it used to be all about one-way communication, companies putting their brochures online effectively. And how did it change? Well, it went to two-way communication, user-generated content, wikis and blogs and so on. So at its worst, we still get that old idea of CSR, where it isn't going to scale and it's one-way communication, and we call it philanthrocapitalism. This is a book, I don't know if you can read the subtitle, How the Rich Can Save the World. I think that's a disaster of an idea. And in fact, I blogged that it was a disaster of an idea, and the authors blogged back and said I was a disaster of an idea. Uh, but I haven't changed my mind. So how does it change? Well, if we think about a different kind of book, this is a Radical Confessions of a Radical Industrialist. Uh, this is someone you probably all know well, Ray Anderson of Interface. And what did, what did they do differently? Well, he was the first one to admit that we really have a problem that our industrial system is broken, and if everybody even copied the best practice at the time, we would still be unsustainable. And the first company to really commit to being truly sustainable. In 1994, when he made that commitment, he thought it would take six years. By the year 2000, they would have zero impact. He found out that it's a lot more difficult than that. But to his credit, instead of changing the goal, he changed the timeline. So now it's by 2020, they have mission zero, that they plan to have zero impact. So we'll uncover a little bit more what we mean by 2.0, but it starts to give you some idea. We can test it using five principles. The first is creativity. And unfortunately, all those codes and standards that we have today are not very good about inspiring creativity. They tend to create a compliance, tick box mentality. Let's take, by contrast, an example. This is Anurag Gupta of a company called A Little World. And this is a microbanking enterprise in India. And what they do is, in the villages of India, they set somebody up as a branch, and this is a woman who sits at her kitchen table. All she has is a mobile phone and this biometric scanner. Somebody comes to her from the village. They don't need to be able to read or write. They don't need any proof of documentation or residence. All they do is they speak the name into the mobile phone. That becomes their identity imprint. They take the fingerprints. Two days later, they have a bank account. That phone holds 50,000 records for five years. So the branch is the phone plus this one lady. That branch takes 80 US dollars a month to run. This is using entrepreneurship and creativity to solve some of the biggest problems that we have. In this case, poverty and the unbanked. We have to think differently about CSR. 
The second test then would be scalability. We have so many wonderful solutions, sustainable products, pilot schemes which demonstrate sustainable living, and yet they don't go to scale. And until they go to scale, the world is still heading in the wrong direction. So how do we get to scale? Well, there are basically two ways. The one is that companies need to start doing something called choice editing. So what happened when Walmart belatedly woke up to the idea of sustainability? This was under the leadership of Lee Scott. I don't know if you know the story, but Hurricane Katrina hit, and uh, in the crisis, their employees opened the doors of Walmart and said, take what you need. They used their logistics capabilities to get things to where they were needed. And Lee Scott could have fired those employees because they'd just given away his products. But instead, it was a wake-up experience, and he thought, how could Walmart be the same company it was during that crisis every single day? And one of the ways that he figured out they could do that was to genuinely take on the sustainability message. So they set themselves three broad goals. Zero waste, 100% renewable energy, and make all their products uh, sustainable. Now, that's a long journey, but to their credit, one of the things they did was they said, we will no longer give customers the choice, do you want unsustainable seafood or sustainable seafood? All seafood products will be Marine Stewardship Council certified. And until we get companies adopting that approach where you're not having sustainable or fair trade as a little niche product on the side, which, by the way, you pay more for, we're not really going to get there. We have to reach scalability. The other way that you get there, of course, is government intervention. We would still be messing around with incandescent light bulbs if the EU hadn't eventually stepped in and said, we ban these now. We have a new, higher, and better standard. The third approach then is responsiveness. Can we be genuinely responsive to the needs of society? Well, I take the example of the WTO, which you're all familiar with, the World Toilet Organization. Um, this is started by a Singapore entrepreneur, Jack Sim. And he was hoping the World Trade Organization would sue him so that uh, he'd get lots of publicity for his cause. His cause, of course, is sanitation. 2.5 billion people who still have inadequate sanitation in the world today. He says everybody loves to talk about water, nobody wants to talk about toilets. And so what he's doing differently is he's using micro-enterprises in partnership with lots of other organizations to deliver low-cost, low-water toilets in the communities in poor areas where they need it around the world. So he's making a business out of responding to one of the biggest challenges we still face today. And then we get locality. I heard it in the introduction. Think global, act local. Yeah? This is something which is easy to say and difficult to do. Let's take SC Johnson as an example. This is a company in the US that makes uh, cleaning products. And they really got the sustainability idea. And more than that, in fact, they got the bottom of the pyramid idea. And so they went to Kenya and they said, uh, we're going to help lift you out of poverty by doing business differently. And so they said, look, we've got this range of household cleaning products. We'll package them in small sachets. We'll sell them to you really cheaply and uh, we'll help solve your problems. And the community said, uh, sorry, we're not interested. And they were just stunned, you know. It turned out, well, actually their houses were pretty clean. That wasn't the issue. The issue was their communal toilets. Ah, oh, well, S.C. Johnson was just delighted because they happened to have a whole range of toilet cleaning products. And they said, we'll package it right and we'll get the price right and we'll help you out of poverty. And so the community said, sure, we'll test your products. Came back and said, we're not interested, your products don't work. And S.C. Johnson was stunned. They've done you know, millions on research and development. They've tested these products. 
What was the problem? It turns out these cleaning products don't work on mud floors and walls. So SC Johnson had to redesign the products to be appropriate for the local level. We have to get these global and local right. And finally, the test of circularity, one that you're familiar with. Uh, we have to close the loop on production. And the idea that we get to a zero waste economy is not such a dream anymore. Fuji Xerox in three plants in, in Asia, in uh, Thailand, in Japan, and in Malaysia, is reaching 98.5% recyclability of their products. So this is no longer such a dream. We have to up the standard on this one. We can't continue growing unless we close the loop. So let me take you then through the 10 forecasts that I have uh, for 2020. How is this agenda going to change? Well, the first thing is that I do believe companies will gradually move through these stages into the more transformative space. The issue at the moment is that we don't have very strong incentives to move companies beyond strategic. There is definitely a business case to get to strategic, but unless we start changing the rules of the game and putting a different kind of pressure on companies, they won't move to transformative on their own, at least not at scale. So I expect that we'll see this evolution continuing. And to give you some idea of where they need to get to, uh, on transformative, what did Patagonia do differently? Well, the first thing is they stepped off the growth treadmill. So the founder said, I no longer am going to aim to be the biggest company that does outdoor clothing. I'm going to be the best company. And if that means that I don't grow next year, that's fine. So he set that expectation. The second thing that he did was he transformed an industry by doing a life cycle study of his product and finding out that cotton, which he thought was very natural and good and white and fluffy, it must be clean. No, it's extremely dirty, very chemical intensive, very water and energy intensive. So what did he do? He committed to 100% organic cotton. At the time, there wasn't even enough organic cotton in the United States to supply just his one company. So he transformed that whole industry. And the third thing he did differently, well, he, he tried out sustainability reporting. He commissioned some consultants to produce a GRI report. They came and it all looked wonderful. And he, he came and he sat with his board. And in his words, if you'll excuse his language, he said, this is bullshit. This is not a true reflection of how my company impacts the, the, the planet and the society. And he threw it in the bin. They never published a GRI report. And instead, what they did was came up with a footprint chronicles, which measured down to the uh, a life cycle, down to the product level, exactly the impact that they're having. So you can buy a pair of organic jeans, and you can know that this pair of organic jeans creates this much waste, uses this much water, puts this much carbon into the atmosphere, and by the way, traveled this distance to get to me. Can you get a feeling for how this is different to a w w the way a lot of companies are approaching it? The second forecast then is we're going to have to move beyond codes and standards. Now, it doesn't mean that codes and standards are going to disappear. They will just become the minimum requirement. Probably there'll be a shakeout, so this proliferation we've seen will consolidate, and there'll be a few that, that come through and, and endure. But actually, that compliance mentality has got to give way to innovation. And we can all think of many innovative products. I'll just give you one example. So Freeplay, you may have come across the company. Uh, what are they tackling? Well, in many parts of the world, uh, people don't have access to electricity. So they start by creating uh, first a torch and a radio, but now even heart rate fetal monitors, so that monitor a baby's heart rate, very important for child survival. And what's different about them? It all works on wind-up technology. You don't need any electricity to work these 
products. And there are many examples we can think of, of where we use innovation and social enterprise to solve problems that we face. The third forecast is one I've mentioned already. We have to move through to choice editing. This idea of the ethical consumer, as important it is, as it is as a stepping stone, it is not sustainable. And I'll give you an example here. Uh, some research done in, in Australia, fair trade coffee. Very conscious people, Australians. And uh, so they put a sign in the window Fair trade coffee, no extra charge, just ask. What percentage of Australians do you think went for fair trade coffee? It was 1%. Then they changed the experiment. They prompted people, would you like fair trade coffee, madam? And it went up to 30%. And then they changed the experiment again. They asked somebody, would you like fair trade coffee when somebody was standing next to them? and it went up to 70%. <laughs> Can you see this is about psychology? And we're very, very conscious of this value-action gap that what we say we, uh, we do is not what we really do. And so as long as we have premium-priced, responsible and sustainable products, it will always only remain a niche. In most of these areas, we get up to about 10% of the market, if you look at fair trade tea and coffee and organics and so on. And 10% won't cut it. We need 100%. Um, we also need to move beyond this idea of charity or sponsorships to really supporting social enterprises and partnerships. We, one of the things we've discovered is that business on its own can't solve this, neither can government and neither can civil society. So what do you do if you're... Uh, a company like Rio Tinto. You dig really big holes in the ground, that's how you make your money. So who's going to be your enemy? Well, probably the conservation organizations. So instead of fighting with them, you get into a partnership, Rio Tinto and the World Conservation Union, IUCN. And you say, how do we work out this biodiversity issue together? We're not going to stop mining, you're not going to stop caring about the environment, let's figure out how we can satisfy both of our goals. We have to think collaboratively going forward. I sometimes say now, you know, when I talk about CSR, uh, you'll see in some of my writing that I, I talk about corporate sustainability and responsibility. And just lately I've started changing that C as well to collaborative sustainability and responsibility, which I think really has to be the future. We also have to go from purely local solutions to global solutions, global and local. I'll give you another example. When I was running KPMG Sustainability Services, we got brought in by BHP Billiton, one of the biggest mining companies in the world. They got rated on a European CSR index, and they did very badly, and they couldn't understand it. They thought they were very responsible. So we did some investigation for them. Well, it turned out that... If you're rated on an index in Europe, you better be doing energy efficiency because we care about climate change here. Yeah. The fact that most of their operations were in the southern hemisphere, in places like Mozambique and South Africa, where they have some of the cheapest electricity in the world, and actually the biggest problem is that half of their employees are dying of malaria, well, you've got no points on this index for doing public health. So in this case, they got the local solution right. They had a very good malaria prevention program, but they didn't get the global issue right, which was climate change. And we have to get both right going forward. From the take-make-waste take -waste model to cradle-to-cradle -cradle, uh, or, or the circular economy, this, this cannot only happen at the product level. It has to start happening at the regional or the city level. Okay, this is Kalenburg in uh, Germany where the whole system is designed so that the waste from one industry becomes the input to another industry. And we're getting much smarter at this. There's a new uh, uh, set of plants in, uh, uh, in China, Austria, uh, and the UK that is run by MBA Polymers. For the first time, we figured out how to take plastic from 
mobile phones and computers and motor cars and completely recycle it so that nothing is wasted and it comes back out of plastic on the other side that can be reused in those industries. And the remarkable thing about it is not a single hand touches that uh, process. So it's all done with sophisticated radar and sorting processes. We're getting smart at this. We can do it, but we have to design it that way. Not like where we still have in the United Kingdom, we throw away mobile phones after nine months. Perfectly good mobile phones. We also, I think, will see a move from things like the Global Reporting Initiative and all these rankings that we see over and over again. They're really problematic because if you've got 150 indicators, can you really make sense of that as a stakeholder? And if you've got a ranking and you're an analyst and the one ranking contradicts the other, can you really make sense of that? I'm not sure how useful it, it is. I remember speaking to the CSR manager for Bayer, the pharmaceutical company in China, and he said in the same week, he got a prize for being one of the most sustainable companies and a prize for being the fourth most toxic company in the world. What do you do with that? So I think that we're going to see a, a move to, uh, to generally acceptable sustainability standards or practices, much like the generally accounting accept, accepted accounting standards. Um, we will get to some kind of consensus on that, but also I think we will move more to ratings than rankings. And by that I mean far more a system that's like the credit ratings that we see for countries and for companies. Because if I see that this company is an A plus and this one's an A minus and this one's a B minus, I can start to compare. Now we're not gonna probably get to this only by having rating agencies. I think we're in a web 2.0 world. Uh, one of the companies I'm working with through Kaleidoscope Futures is wikirate.org, it's a startup. And what it will do is rank and rate and profile companies using Wikipedia type technology. So the crowd ends up creating the ranking and the rating for the company. And I think that's the way it's going to go. I think this idea of self-regulation is an experiment that has failed. I mean, we've done this for at least 20 years now. Let's leave companies to do voluntary standards. And really, it's got us into the trouble that we're in. One of the reasons for the financial crisis was financial deregulation. And companies are very keen to do voluntary standards because they're saying, don't regulate us too hard. We can do this ourselves. And unfortunately, those voluntary standards only take us so far. Somehow, we have to get to co-regulation where government and business are working together, not in an incestuous lobbying manner, but actually to be more progressive. And I'll give you an example here of the Corporate Leaders Group on Climate Change. This is a group we work with through Cambridge University and the uh, Prince of Wales, because what we were finding was that companies were coming to us and saying, we can't do progressive investments in climate change technologies because they're big investments and we don't have a certain policy horizon. And the government was coming to us and saying, we can't do progressive policy on climate change because we know companies will lobby against us. And so we ended up have to, having to play this uh, uh, mediator role where we would let government whisper in our ear, what is the public message you need companies to come out with in order to give you some room to be progressive on policy? And from business side, what is, what is the policy targets that you need from government in order to make these big investments? As a result, the UK now has probably the strongest climate legislation in the world. And we, this works now also at an EU level and we have some of the more progressive legislation here. So we have to be working together to break this catch-22. And then this idea that we can only report at a corporate level and once a year, I think is gonna go out the window. In a real-time world that we live in today, for the first, first thing I want is real-time information. I want to actually be 
picking up if there's been an explosion or there's been a, a funny smell in my community or something's going on with the plant or the factory next door, I want to go online and see what, what's happening with that right now. I want a stream of data that comes live from the company and gets updated all the time. That's the first shift that's going to have to happen. Even quarterly reporting on this, I think, is going to become outdated, let alone annual. The second thing is, how useful is it to know all of these numbers at a corporate level? Okay, so Starbucks has this impact. Well, what's the impact here, where I'm living, in my community? I think that reporting is going to have to go down to the product level. And by that, I mean full life cycle impact assessments of the products, and then creating an opportunity for customers to access that information at the point of sale. You're probably familiar already with Good Guide. It's a US application. On your iPhone, you scan the barcode when you're in the store. It works for some products here as well. And you immediately get a rating for its social impact, its environmental impact, and its health impact. It's just one example of where we're going to start to get that product level information. And then, of course, we're going to rely more and more on the public to whistleblow on particular products and particular companies, WikiLeaks type uh, whistleblowing. Final forecast then is that uh, all of you are going to be out of a job in the next uh, 10 years. If we succeed, then uh, I think this idea of centralized CSR departments is actually going to become rather outdated. It's going to be very difficult in the future to be a CSR generalist. So uh, having said you'll be out of a job, you'll probably just be in a different job, a more specialized job. Because what we're learning is that this is a complex agenda. And you will have to be an expert in human rights in the supply chain in China rather than a CSR expert. Or you'll have to be an expert on you know, energy efficiency in the extractives industry in Africa. So expect to be able to specialize more and more so that we can really solve these issues rather than have these general policy uh, types who sit at the head office uh, and make prescriptions. So I'm often asked then, so if, if we want to take this seriously, what do we do? And I think there are five steps. If you were to go into your office tomorrow and say, where do I start? You have to start with reassessing. You have to look at what is your real impact and not the impact that you're going to publish and that needs to look like a public relations exercise, but the real impact. What is the footprint of your company uh, or your department or your government or your city? And be honest with yourself. Uh, are you really taking away more than you're giving back? Start with that. The second is who are you in bed with? What are your partnerships? Are you only speaking to people who agree with you? Do you have a challenging NGO on your advisory board? We really have to look at collaboration as the next step. Who's going to take your organization from where it is today into a completely different world going forward? Uh, one of the things I hope that you realize is that we are going through a revolution. Uh, capitalism as it is today, the industrial system cannot survive. It is unsustainable. In fact, it's broken. And we're in the process of reinventing it. So who is going to be the ones that can take you through that very stormy, hard rain as we go, go to the future? The third point is, what does your leadership look like? Do you have somebody who's really redefining that agenda? I mentioned Ray Anderson earlier. He said when he made his announcement to become the first truly sustainable company, people said he was round the bend. And he said, absolutely, that's my job as a leader, is to see round the bend where other people can't see. To, to make a vision for the company that takes people's breath away because they don't know how we could possibly get there. It's the same thing that people like Paul Pullman are doing with Unilever. 
saying that they're going to double in size, halve their environmental footprint, and help a billion people out of poverty? How are they possibly going to do that? Well, one of the things they realize is they're going to have to work in changing their customers' behavior and their suppliers' impacts. Very little of it is actually in their production. And then the redesign. So we have to innovate. If CSR has got nothing to do with your products and services, it's an old-style CSR. It's got to be about reinventing the very basis for your business. Because unless we can come up with solutions to these problems through the market, it really won't go to scale. And finally, the most difficult, but perhaps the most important, how do we change the rules of the game? The transformation happens when we can work with policymakers to set different rules. We sometimes forget when we talk about Adam Smith's invisible hand of the market. You know, today the invisible hand seems to spend a lot of time pleasuring itself. But actually, Adam Smith was a moral philosopher. He wrote a book called The Moral Sentiments of the Market. He assumed a set of rules. And we have to get back to that, that situation where we have a framework that incentivizes the right behavior. Well, I'd like to end on a, a cartoon and then a final comment. Uh, so one of you here, uh, I expect uh, uh, a question, one of you, what if it's a big hoax, like a, it's a joke, the CSR stuff, and we create a better world for nothing? Yeah, and that doesn't make any sense. So I realize we're all in this room because we're trying to make a difference, we're trying to create a better world, and I just hope that I've convinced you, or at least got you thinking, that currently we are falling short. We really need to challenge companies and ourselves to say, are we fooling ourselves? We're doing more than ever before, we can measure more than ever before, but let's look at the impacts. Are things getting better or worse on the ground? And let's try and make that agenda come together. As I was walking around Ghent yesterday, I saw <laughs> one of these. And I kind of got thinking last night, is this the future of CSR? We need to make a really long journey. CSR is a, uh, is a journey of a thousand miles. I think a lot of sustainability in CSR is like this at the moment. It's people throwing their, uh, their boots up on the wire and it's kind of fun and it it's, uh, attracts some attention and maybe it even creates a trend, you know, and lots of people throw their boots up there. But actually we need the boots on our feet. We need everybody to be wearing those sustainability boots and making the uh, long journey. It's not going to be necessarily glamorous, but uh, we need to be in it for the long haul. We are changing capitalism. We are going through the next industrial revolution. The only question for us, for you and I in this room, is which side of history are we going to be on? That's the choice and that's the answer that we have to come up with for ourselves. Thank you. <laughs>
an old and a tired and a worn out concept, but that is because of a very narrow interpretation. One of the things I'm trying to do is just to reinterpret and reinvigorate that to say that actually it is about bringing in the sustainability and the responsibility. Um, of course, we have new concepts like well, shared value, lots of debate about whether that's really new. Um, lots of academics calling Michael Porter a pirate because uh, he's stolen ideas and not given any acknowledgement. But uh, I think we have to, each, each company and each country has to find a, a description that works for them. And for me, so long as it has those four elements, so long as it's really about value creation, it's about good governance, it's about societal contribution and environmental integrity, I don't really mind what people call it. Um, and, and I do think we have to question some of the labels. We have to question the C, the corporate. That's why I'm more and more I talk about collaborative rather than corporate. Um, we have to find a, a, a concept that works for SMEs as well as for big companies, and actually that works for government departments and NGOs as well. It's one of the reasons why ISO 26000, there is no C in the standard. Yeah? It's only social responsibility, which could apply to any organization. Um, so I, I don't think we've solved that problem about what to call it, uh, but I, I do think that bringing together those four strands and not forgetting the governance, which is the value strand as well, uh, at least we start to get on the same page uh, about what we're talking about. Maybe just, um, I do not want to steal much time, but just a, a remark that I forgot to mention. Uh, you spoke about Ray Anderson. Now, if you read the book of Ray Anderson, um, his initiative started from the idea, I have to develop a sustainable business. And at the given moment, he also uses the rather shocking word saying, Nobody else can do it except we, the business. Mm. It's not the church, it's not the universities, it's not the government, which is quite shocking. And, and many people forget that he was saying this. And I think this comes from the kind of um, a distrust that exists between society and business. Yep. It's a well-earned distrust, I would say. I mean, I think that uh, companies have given us lots of reasons to distrust them. Um, and I think one of the things that uh, even Interface has learned on that journey since 1994 is that actually they can't do it on their own. Uh, so the collaborative mode, I think, has become far more important because these problems are big and complex. I think the point that he did make, and which I would agree with, is Companies are more, uh, more innovative, they move faster, uh, they can redesign products which can make a real difference. So the idea that we have to wait for government or wait for you know, the academics to agree on a definition or anything like that, I think that's not true. I think uh, companies can and, and do move quickly if the incentives are right, uh, but they certainly, they certainly can't do it on their own. Hello, my name is Damien Dalmagne. Uh, the question I want to ask is uh, regarding the five levels you described. Don't you think that to really get at the heart of CSR 2.0, which is level five, businesses have to, to question the, the way they organize their own business model? Everything so far from level one to four is around the business model. Yep. It, doesn't, it doesn't get into the gist of what is the type of business I do mm -hmm. and how do I get paid and and uh, how do I make my money out of that business? And most of existing businesses are intrinsically uh, biased so that because they're, they're uh, structured in terms of volume, the growth comes from volume, by design, the only way to grow is to have more of and therefore requiring more resources, putting more pressure on work and so on. Don't you think that the actual way to tackle that, to get to that level five is by questioning the business models, just like, for example, the functional economy is trying to do? Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think it's one of the reasons why it's so difficult to get to transformative. You know, transformation means changing your business model. And all the incentives, uh, 
you know, get companies as far as strategic because they don't actually have to change necessarily what they do and how they do it. Uh, they align a few things, they have a few codes and standards. Uh, how do you change to a completely different basis of, of uh, you know, the way we conceive capitalism and, and industry? And that, that's the point that we're at, and we don't have all the answers. So some companies are managing to do that redesign, but we're all operating within a system which incentivizes a lot of that old behavior. And let's face it, in, a, in an economy that's totally dependent on fossil fuels. So how do you get to 80 or 90% less carbon in the atmosphere by 2050 without completely reinventing that system? We have to. And that's the experimental phase that we're in. So that, that's why I think innovation is at the heart. It's not only innovating products, but how do you innovate businesses so that the very heart of the business is delivering uh, social value? And, you know, I have this discussion often that people say, yeah, but even with the journalist this morning, uh, you know, but surely companies are there to make profits, so their incentive is to make money. And that is a complete misunderstanding. The purpose of a company is never to make profits. It's like saying our purpose is to breathe. No. We need to breathe, of course. Uh, it's, it facilitates our life, but it's never going to be the purpose. The purpose of a company is to deliver value in society, and that includes social value and environmental value. So until we can really align the business models to deliver on that, uh, we're going to be in trouble. We need to stop. Thank you very much.